Selecting self-defense ammo, this week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by Modular Driven Technologies. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. And today we're talking about handguns, and this is a question that came off of Patreon, and winners asked us about how we go about selecting uh, self-defense ammunition. And so... I wanted to kind of talk about it because this is one of those topics that uh, you can get really into the minutia about, and we are not going to do that here. Uh, we're not going to delve super deep into it because the deeper you go, the more confusing it gets. And unless you have a huge budget to buy a large amount of ammunition and do controlled ballistic gel tests live tissue tests, all kinds of stuff, uh, you are really not going to be able to compile enough data uh, to be able to make a factual argument that's going to hold its weight in a self-defense shooting. Uh, so instead, I have a slightly different recommendation on how you go about choosing ammunition to put in a carry gun or a home defense gun. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about the two guns that we have sitting here because I intentionally picked them because they are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, this is probably about the largest and craziest thing that anybody would attempt to carry as a concealed carry handgun, although it is really not out of the realm of possibility for a home defense gun. Uh, this is a Glock 17 and has a Zevtech uh, slide and Zev Pro compensator on it. Got a magwell on the bottom, a Surefire X300 Ultra on it, and a Holosun red dot sight on here. Uh, so this is kind of an open class competition slash tactical carry gun, uh, and it is a ton of fun to shoot this guy. Uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum, I have what is now my kind of minimalist carry although it is one step up from my true minimalist carry. And this is the Glock 43X uh, with a TLR6 uh, weapon light on the bottom of it and uh, Trigicon fiber sights on the top of it. Uh, so this is a very comfortable, very compact uh, carry gun. It's really flat and so I can carry it appendix inside the waistband and uh, have almost no problems with printing whatsoever and uh, still have a weapon light capable uh, fighting handgun. I can still get a full grip on this without my pinky hanging off the bottom. I do have a Glock 43 that uh, my pinky starts to drift off the bottom of it with the regular uh, mag extension from Glock on it. If I run the flat bottom magazine, then my pinky does hang off the bottom. I have to curl it underneath. So that is really the gun that I would carry when I wouldn't normally carry a gun. But for all intents and purposes, uh, this is as small as I usually go. And I am usually actually carrying my Glock 19 uh, with the RMR and the uh, Enforce APLC on it. Um, but when we're talking about carry ammo, I have different recommendations for the super compact uh, versus this big guy here. And we'll talk about that really quickly. Uh, now, both these handguns are 9mm. 9mm, uh, I think, is probably one of the most popular uh, defensive carry rounds. Uh, we're not going to get into the argument about 9mm versus 40 Smith & Wesson versus 45 ACP. Um, I don't have any 40 Smith & Wesson guns. I have 9mm, I have 40 AC, 45 ACP, and I have carried both uh, at different points uh, in my career and different points as a armed citizen. Uh, currently, 9mm is my favorite because uh, the most important thing in a self-defense shooting is placing rounds rapidly where they do the most damage. Uh, so shot placement really is king. I have seen guys survive getting hit uh, with large caliber bullets that did not hit critical structures. I have seen guys die very rapidly from uh, 22 and 32 caliber bullets. Uh, so shot placement is king before we even get into discussing uh, bullet considerations, bullet design, etc. 
So we're mainly going to focus on the 9mm though here because we have a huge wide range of ammunition to talk about. Uh, first I will say that any bullet is better than no bullets. These things don't work without bullets. Uh, so if it's a situation where say you have to go with full metal jacket or um, copper plated uh, lead bullets which is basically training ammo. Um, training ammo in this gun is still going to be lethal. It is still going to be able to stop a threat. Uh, however, full metal jackets bullets do not expand, especially at close range and higher velocities. They have the tendency to overpenetrate, which means they will punch straight through a target. Uh, they will punch straight through drywall. They will punch through doors. They will punch through furniture. Um, this is all somewhat problematic for us uh, because in urban environments, if the bullet goes completely through its intended target, it then has the ability to go on and impact an unintended target. And you own every bullet that you fire. Uh, it would be a very bad situation to get into a self-defense shooting, defend yourself successfully against an aggressor, and then injure an uninvolved party uh, that had nothing to do with your situation. That would be very, very bad and not... Uh, just a ton of stress to add to an already very stressful situation. So we really want bullets that are going to stop inside the target, and that is where jacketed hollow point bullets come in or expanding bullets. Uh, we want that bullet to impact the target, we want the bullet to expand, and we want the bullet to stop within the body of the target. Uh, that does two things for us. First of all, it mitigates that risk of impacting things behind the target, uh, but then it also dumps all the energy of the bullet inside the target. So all that energy that you're generating from the power powder all that energy that uh, is the reverse, causing the recoil in the handgun, uh, we are then using every bit of that energy to impact the target. Uh, when you have a full metal jacket, if it passes straight through, uh, then whatever energy is carrying that bullet on the far side of the target and then impacting structures on the far side of the target is wasted energy. Uh, it's energy that did not go into stopping the threat. So the key thing with jacketed hollow point bullets is you want enough to penetrate deeply enough into the target to hit critical structures. You want expansion quick enough to dump that energy and stop inside the target, and you do not want it to exit the target. Ideally, if we could pick a bullet to do exactly what we wanted it to do, then at the exact range that I needed to shoot a target, I would want that bullet to go through the target. I would want it to expand instantly as soon as it enters the target. I would want it to expand to the largest possible shape that it could for the bore diameter. And then I would want it to pass through at that most expanded state and stop just under the skin on the far side of the target. That would do the most amount of damage that we can apply for a handgun, uh, and I, you know, address that as for a handgun. I add that modifier there because uh, when we start talking about rifle bullets, terminal ballistics for rifle bullets have different mechanics than for handgun bullets. Handgun bullets are generally moving at a slow enough pace. Uh, that when they impact, the mechanism that is causing the damage to the body is just this crushing mechanism. There is some stretch to it, um, but it is mainly crushing of the tissue. So the same kind of mechanism that you would get um, if you hammered a nail into something. You're just, you're just pressing, crushing, moving the structures with it. Uh, you don't really get the shockwave effect that you do from a high-velocity rifle bullet. So that is the key for expanding ammunition. Uh, now, when we start to look into hollow point bullets, uh, hollow point bullets, because the front of the bullet is open or it is uh, more squared off or more flattened off, uh, very often that impacts some reliability of the bullets. Uh, I have had uh, cartridges uh, that would not fire reliably in the Glocks because the jacketed hollow point was too large and the shape of the bullet 
uh, was too abrupt. It was really angular and the bullets would come up the feed ramp and impact the inside of the chamber and they would want to stop. Uh, this was mainly an issue with 45, not so much with 9mm because the 9mm, uh, the angles tend to be a little bit shallower with that larger uh, hollow point. Uh, but with a 45, it was a pretty severe angle and they could impact the chamber and cause malfunctions. So when we are selecting defensive ammo, reliability is key. Uh, it has to function reliably in the gun. So um, I really recommend when you buy ammo, buy a 50 round box and go out and run the entire 50 round box through the gun and make sure you have no malfunctions at all for all 50 rounds. Then go back and buy another box and use that to actually load your magazines and to carry. Um, you don't want to go buy a ton of the stuff because it is very expensive uh, and then find out it doesn't work. You really don't want to buy it and be afraid to shoot it because it's expensive and then find out in a critical situation that your ammunition does not function reliably in your handgun. Uh, so because the vast huge array of designs of hollow points out there, don't just assume that because your gun functions fine with one type of jacketed hollow point, uh, that it will function fine with all types of jacketed hollow points. Uh, that is really, really something that you, you don't want to make that assumption. Uh, so, and the flip side of that is if you have a favorite and it runs fine in one gun, don't assume that favorite will also run fine in another gun. It has to be checked in each and every one. Now, before we get into specific bullet recommendations, um, I will also talk about what you need to do when you load that defensive ammo. Now, if you're just going out to the range to do your check fire and make sure it runs, you don't have to take a ton of care. Just jam the bullets in the magazine, uh, burn them through, make sure that the, uh, the recoil and the flash is acceptable to you, and then gas on. But when you are loading these into your magazines for defensive purposes, we need to take a little bit of extra care. Do not be in a hurry. You want to take each and every bullet out. You want to inspect the bullet, make sure nothing looks strange with the bullet itself. Inspect the case, uh, make sure that you don't have any that are overly long or overly short compared to the other ones. Uh, if you want to go through and you want to take a, a, a caliper and compare each one, that's fine. I don't go to that extent, but I do do a visual inspection to make sure that we don't have any where the bullet has gotten mashed back in. Uh, you want to be very careful and make sure that you look at the primers on each and every one. Uh, it is something where occasionally you'll get a primer that is flipped upside down. It is less common in defensive ammo. I have seen it in practice ammo uh, where you've had a primer flipped. I have seen it at least once in defensive ammo where a primer was flipped. Uh, if the primer is flipped, it will not fire. Uh, that cartridge will be a dud. Uh, so you do want to make sure that you don't have any high primers either. Uh, so run your thumb across of them, make sure that they are fully seated. In the same vein, if you feel a low primer, reject that round. Uh, most of us are not carrying three and four magazines uh, when we are carrying a defensive handgun. Uh, usually we're carrying two, uh, sometimes three, but uh, one in the gun and one spare. Uh, so a 50 round box is usually enough that you can load both those magazines and then you can have some extra. So if you have to uh, reject a round, then it's not that big of a deal. You'll still have enough to fill your magazines. So inspection is really key. And then if you are in a situation where you are unloading and reloading those rounds on a regular basis, uh, let's say for instance that you don't have um, enough magazines uh, to go to the range and shoot separate magazines from your carry magazines and you unload those rounds, make sure you inspect them every time they go back in. Now, even more so for guys that do have plenty of magazines, uh, if you are keeping your magazines loaded, which is perfectly fine, uh, keeping magazines loaded does not wear them out. Uh, if you're keeping them loaded though, when you get done training at the range and you go back and you put your carry ammo back into that gun, you are usually rechambering uh, the top one or two cartridges and you're doing that time and time again. Uh, so when that round slams into the feed ramp and goes up in, 
certain calibers, 45 is more apt to do this than smaller calibers like 9mm, uh, you can get some setback on that bullet. Uh, you can also start to loosen up the bullet in the cartridge, so the bullet will start to get pushed back a little bit more in the cartridge uh, because the same bullet is hitting the feed ramp and generally the same time you can start to deform that hollow point. Uh, you can also end up with the rim of the cartridge starting to get chipped up messed up bent uh, because you are ex you are ejecting that same round time and time again. Uh, so make sure you're inspecting that round. It may be a good idea to rotate them occasionally. Pop the next round out of the magazine, put that one in, and then swap them out. And again, keep spares. So when you start to notice that round getting beaten up, take it out, put it in the box, put a new one in, and then uh, when you get to the end of your carrier rotation, say maybe once a year at least, uh, replace your carry ammo with fresh carry ammo and shoot out that old stuff. So those are just some tips on the actual carry ammo. Now, what I guess most of you are probably looking for is recommendations on specific carry ammo. Now, I will talk about my experience and then I will also uh, talk about a very easy easily defensible way to select your carry ammo. Uh, my general carry ammo is Federal Hydroshock or HST. Um, I have carried that ammo for a very long time. I've shot quite a bit of that ammo. Uh, it has been very reliable with a couple of caveats there. Um, it works well in low light. I have shot it in uh, low light scenarios and not, it, there's not a blinding flash to it. There's a little bit of a flash, but it's not a big deal at all. Uh, but the main thing is it has been supremely reliable in the Glocks that I generally carry it in. Uh, now, my department does use Federal HST, which that makes it very defensible for me in court, even in a civilian shooting. Um, it's also something that I recommend to our local uh, civilians that carry concealed. Uh, because the local police department uses it, it's very easy uh, to point your recommendations to them and say, well, I use it because they did the testing, and if it's good enough for them to use, uh, then as a, a citizen, it's good enough for you. Um, now, in the Federal HST or the Federal Hydroshock, there are a wide variety of uh, selections on bullet and power loads. Uh, the two that I have here, I have the 124 grain HST uh, plus P. Uh, so this is a plus P, which is a higher power factor in ammunition. Uh, then I also have the 147 grain Hydroshock. They also make 147 grain uh, HST. Uh, there's a slightly different design in the bullet. Uh, the Hydroshock is the older design. The HST is the newer design. Uh, it has a little bit to do with the mechanics around the expansion, but it's really not worth getting into the details. Either one of these expand very well and they work very well on uh, humanoid targets. So the uh, 147 grain Hydroshock or HST, whichever one you choose, and a lot of that comes up to just what is available in your area, uh, is a really good option for the smaller handguns. Uh, that is generally what I will carry in compacts and subcompacts. Um, the recoil of the 147 uh, HST or 147 Hydroshock, but the standard velocity uh, is very easy to manage in these smaller handguns, which means you're able to keep the gun on target through recoil, it means your follow-up shots are going to be faster, and you're going to be able to uh, get the impacts where you need them to be to do the most damage rapidly and stop the threat. Uh, I do not recommend the Plus P in the smaller handguns because it is snappier. Uh, it can cause all kinds of other problems associated with uh, the higher recoil. Now, this isn't a across the board. If you have gone out and you have shot both of those and you are able to manage the Plus P, which I can manage the Plus P in this handgun just fine. Uh, my shot strings are only a little bit slower with the Plus P than the 147 standard velocity. Uh, then by all means, go ahead and carry it. Just for me, um, I am faster on follow-up shots with the regular 147 uh, than I am with Plus P. So that's my preference is to carry the standard 147 uh, in the compact guns. Now, if we come up to the big guy here, 
Uh, now, this is a heavier compensated gun. Uh, the difference between the Plus P and the 147 is really not that much. Uh, the problem that you run into here is the 147, although with the offensive ammo, it tends to be a little, a little bit hotter. It will cycle this uh, handgun just fine with the compensator on it. Uh, the 124 plus P actually gives me a little bit more energy, it is going to be a little bit more sure to cycle the slide, it's going to be a little bit more reliable than this, and it provides extra gas coming out of the muzzle to be able to utilize the compensator. Compensators work based on redirecting the muzzle gases, so the more gas you have coming out of the muzzle, the more effective the compensator tends to be. Uh, so with this gun, hotter loads tend to function better and I get more energy on the target and I'm able to drive the gun flatter because the compensator is more effective. Now, one thing that we will hear time and time again, and I've heard the argument with compensated guns, is that the flash is going to blind you, the compensator is going to cause all kinds of problems in a defensive situation. And we're actually working on a video to cover all those, but I can tell you right off the bat, that is a non-issue. Um, there is more muzzle flash with a compensator than there is with a plain muzzle when you're shooting uh, training ammo. Uh, when you're shooting defensive ammo, that still holds true, but defensive ammo tends to have flash retarding properties in the powder, and that really reduces your flash versus uh, regular ball training ammo. And with this handgun, uh, when I have enough light to identify the target or when I have the tactical light turned on or the weapon light turned on, uh, I'm able to drive the gun, see through the muzzle flash, and continue to shoot the target with no problems in low light situations. So the Plus P is really a better option in a gun like this. Again, you are getting that extra energy, you're driving that bullet harder, uh, driving the bullet faster with jacketed hollow point designs helps that expansion occur faster inside the target. Uh, so it's just benefits across the board. So I like the 124 HST Plus P for a handgun like this um, in home defense situations, or again, if you choose to carry this. I actually do have a holster. I can carry this appendix, uh, depending upon what my clothing selection is. And I have carried it before uh, just to get the experience carrying this large of a handgun. Uh, obviously, it is not my preferred option because you take this guy, uh, you load up a couple of magazines and throw it in there, and that is quite a bit of weight that you are dragging around uh, for the slim chance that you're going to get into a self-defense shooting situation. Uh, if I would, would I carry something like this as a duty gun? Um, absolutely. This would make a fantastic duty gun if you could get uh, your department to approve something like this, which... Um, Probably unlikely other than special assignments. So the I have had great luck with the HST and the Hydroshock. Now we have had issues before with uh, some of the early 45 ACP Federal HST uh, where there were some squib loads. That I believe is completely resolved, but through that period I got to experience the um, 230 grain uh, HST and then the uh, same load in a plus P, uh, but the plus P, even in a Glock 21 SF, uh, really was a handful. So you want to make sure if you want or think you may want to carry plus P ammunition, shoot standard velocity and shoot the plus P, the faster ammunition, side by side and see uh, if it is worth it to you. If you're st still able to run the gun adequately, uh, then the plus P offers a ton of benefits. But if you are not, again, we come back to that shot placement is key. So I highly encourage you, if you really don't want to delve into the weeds and do all the research on uh, ballistics, penetration, uh, gel expansion, all that, uh, contact your local police department and ask them what their duty ammunition is, what they're carrying, and that's going to help you quite a bit. Uh, now, if you don't want to go that route uh, if you are carrying 9mm. The FBI uh, recently adopted uh, the Winchester PDX-1 ammunition in the 124 grain plus P variety. Uh, so that is a great option if you just want to go to the default 
Uh, they did a lot of testing. They did a lot of research on it. I don't believe that that information uh, is available to private citizens right now. Uh, police departments, if they are evaluating what to go to to a duty round, they can request uh, all the ballistic research on that that the FBI did uh, for their purposes. Uh, but the uh, PDX-1, if it functions well in your handgun, is a great choice because then, again, you have the defensibility of falling back and saying the FBI selected it because it was adequate for use on humans in urban environments, and then it makes it a little bit easier to go that route. Again, you want to make sure it's accurate in your handgun. You want to make sure it's reliable in your handgun. And you don't want to neglect the ammunition. Don't just load it up in your magazines and keep it in there for five years. Uh, you want to make sure that you are replacing that ammunition on a regular basis. And that you're comfortable shooting the plus P version of it. Now, beyond that, when we start to get into um, all the, the other portions of uh, design... I tend to stay away from the fringe ammunition. Uh, I tend to stay away from anything that has extreme marketing or a bunch of craziness uh, because the media can spin that into a really bad direction on a high profile shooting. Uh, so if you're involved in something that for some reason goes national, it gets picked up by uh, the wire services and that, they're going to pick apart every little bit of it. It's not so much of an issue inside a court of law. It's more of an issue in the court of public opinion. Uh, a court of law, a good shoot is not going to be turned bad by the type of bullet that you used. Uh, now, in a civil suit, there are all kinds of different things that come into play. Uh, different states have different rules regarding when you can and when you can't be sued after a uh, justifiable defense shooting. Uh, so that really is well outside the scope of this video. And I am not an attorney, so I would be remiss in giving you advice based upon that. Nothing I say should be construed as legal advice. You definitely want to hire an actual attorney if legal advice is what you are seeking. Um, but just seeing things go through the industry, I have on the shelf somewhere here in the shop uh, a set of old uh, 45 ACP black talons when Winchester first released those. And those caused a huge uh, anti-media storm uh, because the bullets were designed to expand and where the talon name came from is when the hollow point expanded, uh, the, jacketed for the jacket formed sharp points on the pedals of the expanded bullet. Uh, now, the, the points were actually designed for a different reason. They were supposed to help clear out the hollow point uh, to prevent it from uh, getting clothing and all kinds of other things packed into the hollow point. If a hollow point gets packed up when it goes into a target, uh, then it can just act like regular ball ammo and fail to reliably expand. Uh, but they were very quickly... Um, spun into designed to cause extra damage to the target. And uh, for some reason, people that don't really understand the mechanics of um, shooting a flesh and bone target, uh, you are hitting it with a bullet. You're basically causing as much damage as you can possibly cause to the target. Uh, massive damage to those internal structures give you the greatest ability of stopping a threat immediately. So that is really what you're after. All this extra stuff is, is nonsense. It's smoke and mirrors. Uh, but it didn't matter. All this created a media firestorm and the black talon went away. The black coating went away. The little edges on the jackets went away. Uh, it got spun into a totally different product line. Uh, but that's an example how um, marketing and how uh, features on a bullet can get blown out of proportion and go in a really horrible direction. Now, I have that box of ammunition on the shelf. I did prior to the media firestorm. Uh, I did carry it in my uh, 1911. Uh, but after all of the bad press about it, I removed that ammunition from service, put it in the box, put it on the shelf, uh, and went with a more standardized round, which happened to be the 45 Hydroshock at the time. Um, now, there are a bunch of other companies that I'm not going to go into and mention that have all kinds of high-speed fancy names on their stuff and all kinds of fragmenting and jacketing and, and crazy uh, stuff that uh, they put out in their marketing material. You really want to look at that with a critical eye and determine how that's going to be looked at 
in the wake of a self-defense shooting. Um, because even if you are totally righteous, the media has a habit of being able to spin things into something that it was not. Uh, so again, bear that in mind, and that's where that uh, ability to point to your local police department or point to the FBI, ATF, etc., and say, they are using this, I chose it because uh, they did the research and they found it suitable for their purposes, so I figured it was going to be suitable for mine. Uh, it makes it a little bit more difficult uh, for someone to attack your motivations uh, when the police departments that are charged with protecting the public are utilizing that. So hopefully that is not too much of a rambling discussion on my justifications and the reason that I select the ammunition I do. Uh, no part of this video was sponsored by Federal. Federal Premium does help us out on some other projects. They have sent us ammunition in the past, uh, but I pick the uh, HST and the Plus P again. Uh, I'm sorry, the HST and the Hydroshock because it is uh, what I've been issued at work. It's what I carry and is what we have seen uh, to be highly effective in officer-involved shootings and self-defense shootings here in this area. Uh, so that's going to do it for this Mail Call Mondays. If you guys have any questions or comments over anything I've covered, drop in the comment section below or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, we do have some Precision Rifle content coming up next week, uh, so don't worry. We're not going to hang out on the handgun stuff, and we have been covering a lot of 22 stuff, uh, but we're going to switch over and do some centerfire rifle uh, content next week as well. So stay tuned with us for that. If you like the video, make sure you like, share, and subscribe, and and hit that little bell icon so you get notified when we release the next video. And until next time, get out and shoot.